Please stand for the reading of God's Word. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together, and they seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. When the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence in the crowd. For the mob of people followed, crying out, away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, well, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in the city and educated at the feet of Gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished." As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles." Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. 
But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do for this man is a Roman citizen? So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I'm a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. This is God's word. You may be seated. Whew, that's a lot of scripture. Yeah, get to read it once more. Ah, speak the truth. The truth matters, it does, especially in these times that we live in. Fake news, TikTok, texts and bullying of kids. We have Supreme Court justices who refuse to speak the truth about what a woman is. Goodness, Elon Musk right now wants to buy Twitter in an effort to preserve free speech. There are so many pressures not to speak the truth because speaking the truth has consequences, but failing to speak often has greater consequences. Paul was beaten and imprisoned as a result of lies, gossip, and harsh assumptions. He had to speak the truth to clear his name Yet, the corrupted Roman government preserves his life by arresting him. This is, this is a wild scripture we have today. And these are some of the things we're going to explore as we go through this and look at these three more main points today. Blinding bias and assumptions, speaking their language, and fight for your right. Blinding bias and assumptions. You might remember some of this text from our last sermon if you were with us. I included it because Paul finds himself in trouble because the Jews who came down from Asia. But upon Paul's greeting with the Jewish Christians, he was warned by them how a lot of people thought he was teaching Gentiles against the law of Moses and the traditions of the Jewish people. The moment that these Asian Jews saw Paul, they pounced on him No question, they wanted to kill him, but it begs the question, like, on what basis? Why do they want to seize and kill Paul? And it was all assumptions and lies. But where did these come from, this idea that Paul is anti-Jewish? It was actually from the zealot Jews. At one point, they were fighting with Paul, saying how Gentile Christians needed to be circumcised to be saved. And this was the whole purpose behind the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, where church leaders, leaders came together to give a decision on how the Gentile Christians were to interact. But it wasn't Paul that made these decisions. It was James, the leader of the church, It was the apostles. It was the local elders of the Jewish Christian church. And they made this decision that the Gentile Christians should be mindful of their Jewish brothers in those Gentile churches, that they should be mindful of how they eat and drink in their presence, and that they should avoid sexual immorality. So that was the decision the church leaders made and gave Paul this letter to take to all the Gentile churches to say, hey guys, we got an update. This is how we are to behave. And so Paul did that and he taught these churches. He built them up. He encouraged them. But he was the messenger of this decision. But look at what, what the Jews of Asia Minor are doing. They want to put it all on Paul. They want to label him as being against the Jewish people and their culture, and they want to kill him. And this is all based off of horrific assumptions and lies. Paul nearly lost his life over it. And we see clearly the sin and destruction that comes from lies, assumptions, and gossip. Now, we find ourselves in a different time 
No one's getting heated over whether or not you should circumcise your children. If so, that's weird. And uh, no one's following the Jewish traditions and fighting over that on whether we should eat meat or not. But there, there are things going on in our lives where lies, gossip, and assumptions bring us great pain and destruction. Tweets, TikTok, social media, we find ourselves in a similar trap where lies, gossip, and assumptions can destroy someone's life. And our teens have to deal with this every day. Every day. Now, that's not the case for me. I don't know how to tick. I don't know how to talk. On Twitter, I only follow theologians and investors. But there's still a trap for me. The trap of fake news. It's just a share button away. There are so many ditches and traps for truth and honesty online. And if we're honest, our passivity is what fuels the flame. We passively reshare. We passively assume this latest article about whoever it is is true. And how dare they? And let's post it online. How many times have I or yourself got really heated over the latest update from whoever it is in the latest article on Fox News or CNN? And then time goes on and we realize, oh, that really wasn't the whole story. Man, I was kind of foolish. So quickly we can fall into these traps. And in Acts 21, the people swallowed the assumption, bought the lie, and jumped into destruction. We just do it with our screens. Gossip, lies, assumptions can so quickly destroy people and destroy fellowship when we don't stand for and speak the truth. Think about yourself. Have you had an instance the last month or week where someone has said something or wrote something and you went, how dare they? And then you realize, oh, they didn't mean what I thought they meant. But what did that do to your affections, your heart, your, your feelings towards them? The passivity, it fueled the flame. And so we have to be on guard because we live in a world where words fly around so quickly and it is very easy for us to play that game of speaking lies and playing into gossip when we should be pursuing truth. Even the tribune, the, the leader in Jerusalem, even the tribune got it wrong with Paul. He thought he was an Egyptian assassin. Like, how wild is that? An Egyptian assassin who leads thousands of men and see, the backstory of this was actually a few years earlier, there was an Egyptian assassin. Josephus, the historian, wrote about this, recorded that this Egyptian assassin came to overthrow Rome, sat outside the city, and Felix, the governor, caught wind, sent all his troops and killed and captured them to stop this attack. But the Egyptian assassin miraculously slipped away never to be seen again. So the tribune is thinking, well, everyone's pouncing on this guy and want to kill him. It must be the Egyptian assassin. Let's bring him in and get him. In the midst of all the lies and assumptions and chaos, what does Paul try to do? He tries to speak the truth. Hey, tribune, hey, you got it all wrong. I'm not an Egyptian. I'm Saul. I'm from Tarsus, the eloquent city, the cultured city. I'm not some assassin. You know what? You can't control the crowd right now. Let me, let me go talk to them. Let me settle everything. Let me cause a conversation where we can chill out, which brings us to our second point, where Paul speaking their language. Paul speaks. Paul gives a testimony. Paul tells the truth. And the reality is you can't argue with the truth. 
If it really happened, it could be verified, it could be accounted for, it could be accepted. And that's what Paul tells them. He says, guys, you have it all wrong. I am not anti-Jewish. I am not against the Jewish people or their culture. Let me tell you all about it. In fact, I am a Jew. I was born in Tarsus. And on top of that, I have the finest education any Jewish man can have. I stuttered under Gamaliel. This is Ivy League education and how to be the greatest Pharisee. And friends, see, Gamaliel, he was one of the most respected and honored teachers of the Jewish laws. We get a hint of this in Acts 5. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. This guy, Gamaliel, he is legit. It's like saying, Michael Jordan taught me how to play basketball, which I know you might believe. It's like saying Tiger Woods taught me how to putt, or Tom Brady taught me how to throw a spiral, or it's like saying Jimi Hendrix taught me how to play guitar, or Johann Sebastian Bach taught me about music. This is the dude of dudes. This is the best. I stuttered under, studied under Gamaliel. I have the best education in town. And as far as being zealous for Jewish culture, there is no one who's more zealous than me, Paul. There is no one more zealous. I gathered up all the Christians and persecuted them. I was there when they stoned Stephen. I was approving it with my thumbs up. You don't believe me? Go ask the high priest. Go ask all the Pharisees. Go ask all the elders. They literally gave me a letter and sent me to Damascus to gather up all these Christians and bring them back so they can be punished. No one was more zealous for the Jewish culture than me. But on this way to Damascus, guys, you won't believe this, I was knocked off my horse by Jesus Christ himself. That's what he says. He says he got in this interaction where Jesus came to him and said, quit killing and persecuting my people. And then you don't think I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish enough? Ananias, everyone loves Ananias in Damascus. He is the respected old guy in town. He came to me and told me that our, the, the God of our fathers appointed me, Paul, to hear and see Jesus. And Ananias helps me convert to Christianity in the spot and baptizes me into the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus has a plan to bring salvation. And truly, a faithful Jew like yourself would know this, right? You're the teachers. You're the the educated ones. You would know this plan of God, how God called Father Abraham and was to make him a great nation that would then bless every nation. Don't you remember, Jews? Psalm 72 God of Israel who works wonders alone, blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. All nations, brothers. It was God's plan this whole time to bless the nations and bring salvation to all. And he has done it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the righteous one. He was the Christ the scriptures longed for, and he died to save sinners. Anyone may believe. I, Paul, was a murderer. I captured and killed Jesus' people, yet he brought the gospel to me to be saved. Anyone can receive his perfect life on your behalf, a life that pleases God. Receive his perfect death on your behalf, a death that appeases the wrath of God for your sin. Anyone can accept his resurrection to have life eternal. This is the gospel. This is the salvation Jesus offers and the salvation that I bring to the Gentiles. 
And what do they say? Off with him. Get out of here, Paul. You can't be throwing that G word around again. We had enough. We won't hear it. There's nothing that we're to do with the Gentiles. He doesn't deserve to live. And friends, this is what happens with the truth of the gospel. The good news of the gospel, Paul spoke and the truth was rejected. They could have gone to Paul's buddies, verified these stories. They could have gone to the high priest, but they rejected the truth that sinners have rebelled against God and are in need of a Savior, and Jesus is the Savior. Friends, don't be afraid to tell the truth about Jesus. If it is true, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You don't need to talk about yourself. No one wants to hear about you. But talking about Jesus Christ brings life to dead sinners. You need to speak the truth of what God has done. Paul gave a testimony to the miracle of God at work. If you are in Christ, don't be afraid to tell the story of the miracle of God and the work of Jesus Christ in your life. The world wants you to spread its lies and its gossip. These lies that harm and destroy. The lies of transgenderism that hurt and bring destruction to one's life. Tell the truth that God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them and he looked at his creation and said, it is very good. Speak the truth in a world full of lies. Don't be a passive participant to lies and gossip. The world is gonna tell you that your value and your worth comes from your ethnicity, your background, your upbringing, your sexuality. The world is gonna tell you lies about your dignity. Speak the truth in a world full of lies. Your value and worth comes from being a creature of God who was knit together in your mother's womb by God himself. He is the author of life. Therefore, your life has worth. And even more than that, if you are in Christ Jesus, he died to redeem you. Your worth is found in the unmeasurable treasure and value of Jesus Christ himself. God looks upon you and sees you as perfect and blameless and righteous and holy because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. So speak the truth because there is no value or dignity greater than the worth that God has for you as an image bearer and child of God. Don't be a passive participant to lies and gossip. Speak the truth. Speak the truth about who God is and what he is like, how he is a good creator, how he is a loving father, a gracious savior, a mighty refuge, the source of all truth and light. You're not gonna have the answers. You don't need to. Tell the truth of what you know. What do you know about the Lord Jesus Christ? That he died, that he rose, that he saves sinners who will come to him. That is what you need. You can do this. Speak the truth that brings life. And if someone has a problem with that, if someone rejects that, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God himself. So let them take it up with the big guy who conquered sin and death. We can be a people who speak truth because we are the only ones that have the truth of eternal life. Paul spoke the truth. He identified with them by telling him how he was Jewish, how he was, uh, loved the culture, how he was committed, and then he spoke the truth about Jesus. Lastly, we see Paul, when he was in hot water, he appealed to his Roman citizenship. Our last point, fight for your right. They rejected Paul. Yeah, they did. They threw a fit. They even threw dirt. But this moment right here, this is where Paul was imprisoned. He was no longer free. 
to go as he pleased. He was no longer free to go check in on all the churches, to check in on the brothers and sisters, to visit them, to worship with them. He was under lock and key, yet he was an innocent prisoner. Do you see in this story how Paul's arrest was a grace from God? He was, get, he was beaten, he was bloodied, nearing the point of death. And the Roman government wrongly arrested him. And God preserved his life. God is over government because God has established the government. This became the avenue by which Paul's life was saved and ultimately that he was brought before the governor Felix to give testimony. And if you remember, Part of his purpose, his last mission, was to go testify before Rome. Government is a gift from God, and Paul believed this. Watch out, I might get in trouble for that. Paul believed this, he taught this. Last time we were in Acts 21, if you were with us, you might remember how I talked about how Paul wrote to the Roman church while he was making this trip down to Jerusalem. We know this. In Romans 15, he talks about how he was gathering this financial gift to bring to the Jewish Christians who were in need, and he was so eager to get there and bless them because all the Gentile churches put together this gift for the church. So Paul was on his way to Jerusalem when he wrote Romans. He, he had not been beaten and imprisoned when he wrote the letter to Romans. Yet, in Romans, we see how Paul instructs us to relate to the government. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Justice is not your job. Justice comes from God. He says vengeance is mine. He says, church, when evil happens to you, God will take care of it. And trust God with justice, judgment, and dealing with evil. And the very next verse is... Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority, then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he bears, does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Submit to the governing authority over you. Well, why do I need to do that? Because God has placed that authority over you. All authority comes from God himself. It is delegated. It is given from God to be stewarded. So do I need to submit to the government in all things? Well, does Paul tell us that? Is that what he's talking about? No, he's, he's talking about vengeance. How do we respond when evil happens? Leave it to the Lord. The Lord has established a government to bring justice to evil. He gives the government a delegated authority to execute justice against evil. Paul calls it bearing the sword. He says, the government is God's servant for your good. That word servant, that is the same word that we get deacon from. He, he says that the, the government is serving the people and the church 
in a way to execute justice and preserve peace by upholding righteous laws. Therefore, the government is a gift from God, and when it is served and used properly, it punishes evil, preserves life, and peace. Leaders don't get to do what they want. They are stewards of the truth and the law as a means to preserve life. They have an obligation to uphold laws and do what is right. And that is why our story ends with the tribune in fear, because he wrongly imprisoned Paul. Some of the things our elected leaders do are wrong. That doesn't mean government's not good. It means they've stepped out of bounds. Nowadays, it seems like they step out of bounds a lot. They don't have the authority to redefine marriage. God made it. It's his authority. Their authority is to wield the sword and maintain peace. They don't have the authority to redefine what it means to be a man or a woman, male or female. That is God's authority as creator. Theirs is the delegated sword to punish evil and preserve peace. Some elected leaders take evil things and declare them to be good. And scripture says, woe to those who do such a thing. This is another reason by which Christians are called in scripture to pray for our leaders. Pray for them to do the job that God has appointed to do for them to do and to do it in a way that honors him and is upholding righteousness and peace. But when the government fails and perverts justice, perverts authority, those leaders must give an account to God. If they resist being a steward and obedient to their appointed role, they must give an account to God. They must receive judgment because vengeance is mine, says the Lord. When the sword bearer fails to seek justice, the Lord still seeks justice. I think this really hits home if we think about our brothers and sisters overseas who are being persecuted. The Lord will seek justice on their behalf. He's not calling us to do that, even if a corrupted government is crushing the Lord's people. The Lord will bring justice. So Paul believed the government was a gift, and he called them to act accordingly. The tribune didn't believe Paul's testimony and called for him to be flogged that they might get the truth out of him, but you can't do this to a Roman citizen. There's a law preventing that. The centurion knows that, knows he's going to be held accountable before God and the law, so he goes to the tribune and says, hey, what's going on? Paul is a Roman citizen. We can't do this. We are out of line When Christians speak truthfully and appeal to the gift of government to act in line with the law, it reveals the government's folly and their failure to preserve peace in life. It also calls them towards obedience. Christians are calling government leaders to repent and turn from their wrong and pursue righteousness because it is wrong. It's time to speak the truth in a diplomatic way. You know, I've done it. I've called our, gov- our uh, county commissioners, our mayors, saying what you're doing is wrong. You need to do it properly because God has given you an authority and he will hold you accountable. I have reached out to the governor and said, what you're doing is wrong. You will be judged by God because he has given you this delegated authority and you are neglecting it to harm people. It's scary when they reply back. But I am loving our elected leaders when I call them to the righteousness of God that they have been appointed to uphold. And we are loving when we call the government to act righteously by which God has appointed them to preserve peace. So don't be afraid to speak the truth of God. Here, the truth of God has appointed the government with a particular purpose in preserving peace. But what did they do? They said, away with Paul, he deserves to die. You see, God had a plan. 
God guides his people in this plan to bring the gospel to others. Do you see God's plan for you in Jesus Christ? Has God been using friends and coworkers, family or neighbors to bring the gospel to you? Has God been showing you how bankrupt your soul is? Showing you to be lacking and falling apart? Has God been showing your fragility? The tears of a friend, the soft words of a grandmother, or maybe the harsh words of a grandma, they could be tough. Is God pursuing you? Like Paul, you might find yourself in the wrong with God. You've rebelled. You can't get away. God keeps tracking you down, sending people your way. Grandma keeps calling. You can't run from God. Why not run to him? You cannot find protection from God. Why not find protection in him? You cannot find refuge from God. Why not find refuge in God? You have wronged God sinned against him, wrecked things with God, why not let God make things right in Jesus Christ? Because he has a plan, and the plan is bringing the good news of the gospel for people to be saved from sin. There's only two options. You're either a sinner in need of a savior or a sinner who has been saved and needs to talk about the savior. But either way, it's about Jesus He is the truth. We need to tell the truth. And friends, he's done it. The miracle of God has broken into your life. For Paul, God was with him through all the journeys, through the imprisonment, all the way up to his death. He has given us his spirit to pour out wisdom, to lead you in God's activity in your life to make great the name of Jesus. So you got some work to do. I got some work to do. It's time to tell the truth. It's time to speak the truth about Jesus, about the miracle of God at work in Jesus Christ in this world. This morning, I was uh, thinking about this, and an old gospel song came to my mind, which captures this well, by Washington Phillips. It says, If you keep his name a ringing everywhere that you go, he will draw men unto him. That's true. So, Coram Deo, let's speak the truth. Let's keep his name ringing everywhere that we go. And God is faithful to draw men and women and children to be saved from sin. And he delights in using his people to do that. So, let's speak the truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've made us your children and have given us new life. This world that we live in is full of burdens and snares. It is full of lies and deceit, yet you've sent us into the world to speak the truth of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Strengthen us to tell others about the glory of Jesus in his death and resurrection. Holy Spirit, be at work drawing people into our lives that we might love, serve, and share Jesus with. We ask that by your power alone, you might bring salvation to the people of Kitsap County. We ask that by your power alone, you might bring people to salvation and as a result, restore marriages, restore relationships and friendships, and restore peace in all the areas where it's been broken. Lord, use us to bring this great news to our people. In Jesus' name, amen.